Uh, I'm really, really super excited. The other thing, um, I'm sure you're going to talk about it, but the Women's Health Concerns Clinic is really unique in Canada and I uh, really appreciate from the bottom of my heart, our collective hearts, that you do this work. So thank you so much, Dr. Frey, and I'm going to leave it to you. Thank you, Dr. Galia, and everybody at UBC, the Women's Health Research Cluster, and the audience. My apologies for this uh, technical issue. Never happened before here in the hospital. But nevertheless, we're going to be happy to talk about the premenstrual dysphoric disorder, one of the many, you know, well, women's mental health related uh, topics that are at the bottom of my heart in terms of uh, research and clinical. Uh, work. So happy to share some of my experience and uh, foster discussions at the end. So the goal today is a, a overview, uh, much clinical uh, and a little bit of a research gaps as well. But the, the goal today is more about uh, education and uh, knowledge dis dissemination about this important topic. So I have no conflicts of interest to disclose. So this is the first and the last uh, um, slide, okay? So if everybody wants to know my take-home message, here it is. So we're going to review and discuss the neurobiology of the premenstrual dysphoric disorder or, or PMDD. And the take-home message is that current evidence suggests a brain sensitivity to normal hormonal fluctuation, but, and I'll explain to you the but. Um, the next uh, learning object will be to review and discuss the prevalence impact and clinical presentations of uh, PMDD. And the take home message is that PMDD is a prevalent, variable, variable, and pervasive condition associated with higher risk for other comorbid psychiatric conditions and suicide behavior. Last but not least, uh, we're going to review and discuss treatment strategies and the gaps. So, the take home message is that evidence based treatment is largely focused so far on serotonergic based antidepressants and estrogen based contraceptives. And the gap is that the underlying mechanism for new treatment is something that is really, really a major gap in this area. So if we uh, remember uh, that, um, you know, those individuals who um, were assigned as uh, females uh, when they were born, they have a high risk for developing depression, and anxiety throughout the reproductive years. You know, why is it that, that the menarche is the is the period of time that they start separating that. So, of course, we don't want to minimal, you know, minimize the impact of social determinants of health and many, many, many other non-biological important uh, risk factors for uh, uh, associated with risk for depression and anxiety uh, in, in women. But uh, really, um, you know, I will take more of a biological standpoint today and Menarche sounds like has got to do with some of it, and many studies show that even early menarche is one of the risk factors for, for that to, to happen. So as far as the prevalence, uh, most uh, women will report uh, at least one mild PMS symptom. PMS stands for a premenstrual symptom that occurs every or most menstrual cycles, but majority of them, uh, you know, don't have any, any problems with it. Uh, about 20, 30% have uh, a constellation of symptoms called premenstrual syndrome uh, that happens, you know, uh, recurrently uh, every month or every about every month. But again, the majority of these individuals, they do not have any uh, difficulties with their symptoms. 1.2 to 6.4% of them report a severe form of PMS called premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And severe means that either they have major uh, impairments, relationship, work, academic, or they might be able to you know, maintain productivity, but they suffer a lot. There's a whole host of major emotional distress uh, around the PMDD. And 1.2 to 6.4%, I would argue is a lot of people. If we think, uh, compare for instance, what's the prevalence of OCD, it's 2% and OCD is a big deal. What's the prevalence of bipolar one disorder is 1% and bipolar one disorder is a big deal. Schizophrenia is also 1% and schizophrenia is a big deal. So I would argue that one to 6% is also equally a big deal. So a seminal paper from uh, NIMH, uh, uh, um, Schmidt and, and folks um, show that it is hormone, PMDD is hormonally triggered. So if you, they followed uh, a cohort of individuals with uh, premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Okay, this term did not exist back in 1998. So these are folks with premenstrual dysphoric disorder, as we understand today. 
they block their uh, HPG axis, uh, uh, the, the hypothalamus pituitary uh, gonadal um, axis with leuprolite. And by doing so for eight weeks, they block the worsening of those symptoms every month. And then they cap those individuals on leoprolide and added estrogen. And by adding estrogen, the symptoms came back. So this is like worsening of sadness. And then they cross over from estradiol to progesterone. And then again, the symptoms came back. So both administration of estradiol and progesterone while controlling for the endogenous hormones did uh, worsen uh, the symptoms. However, they did so only in the population that had a history of PMDD. They conducted exactly the same treatment protocol. I don't like the word normal here, folks. Um, individuals with no history of PMDD and then nothing happened. So what is the, um, the point here? The point is that those with severe premenstrual syndrome, for nowadays we call PMDD, the occurrence of the symptoms represents the normal, and I would add brain response to normal hormonal changes, okay? Uh, and then they did a, a subsequent study uh, trying to answer, was this the, really the hormone itself that was causing the symptoms or was it the change from low to high when you administer uh, exogenous hormones? So they did the, another study in a different set of uh, uh, population. They did um, placebo, you know, for a month. So they follow those individuals with leoprolite, they block their HPG axis. So there's no influence of endogenous hormones, placebo for a month, and then double blinded them to switch to uh, estradiol and progesterone and for three months. And then they found that was when they switch from placebo to estradiol that first month that the symptoms got worse. And here you have safe self-report and on the right side, you have clinician rated. So these are the, the participants saying that I got worse and these are the clinicians asking them about their symptoms. So regardless of how we measure, you know, the symptoms got worse when they switch from zero to hormones. But as the hormones were kept stable, look, the symptoms went back to baseline. So what wasn't the hormones themselves causing the symptoms was the change was the delta from zero to high that caused really the, the, the disturbance that caused the, the, the emergence of the symptoms. So why would that be that, uh, you know, uh, sex hormones that are secreted in the periphery by ovaries, why do they cause these emotional uh, brain symptoms? Well, number one, we do have a whole bunch of um, estrogen and progesterone receptors in the brain. If you ask where this, uh, uh, receptors are more densely located, I would tell you it's right here in the limbic system, hypothalamus, hippocampus, you know, in the areas that are highly associated with uh, um, mood, reactivity, stress, reactivity, sleep, and, and so on. We do have uh, also uh, receptors in the prefrontal cortex, but less. Uh, in terms of genetics and epigenetics, there are a whole bunch of uh, studies that I won't uh, describe in detail today because outside my, my goal, but if you want to take a, a read of them, uh, they are quite uh, complex and suggest that, you know, there are some variances, for instance, estrogen, estrogen um, receptor alpha gene associated with uh, PMDD. There is this ESZE complex, which is a genetic complex that is linked somewhat with uh, uh, the sex uh, hormones as well that seems to be intrinsically associated with a premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And then more recently, uh, Peter Schmidt and Bruce McEwen did a, a collaborative study where they looked at both mice and uh, humans and cross species from mice to humans. You know, there, is a, there seems to be a link between the BDNF VAL66 MAT genotype that uh, Dr. Galea knows very well uh, and uh, links with, uh, you know, the estrogen uh, uh, pathway as well. Uh, uh, genetically speaking. So some hints as how, you know, genetically, epigenetically PMDD might occur. If you look at the neuroimaging literature, there's, uh, this is a really elegant paper summarizing some of the neuroimaging studies that investigated the links between the change in hormonal, uh, normal physiological change in hormones uh, within the luteal phase and the, some of the neuroimaging metrics, for instance, the resting state uh, fMRI, 
looking at brain connectivity, showing that the changes in uh, those uh, uh, um, uh, hormones can uh, enhance the connectivity between salience uh, 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 networks and the def default mode uh, network as well. And those areas have, are associated with more reactivity to, uh, uh, to the stress. So as a brain areas associated with uh, stress reactivity. And also these changes can lead to more vulnerability for developing negative uh, memory uh, experience and then eventually the affective symptoms that we see. So I will uh, recommend uh, this uh, paper for those who are interested in looking deeply into that. And remember when I said, but uh, we know that uh, a whole bunch of studies that looked at estrogen levels, progesterone levels, LH levels, FHH levels, none of that seems to be abnormal in PMDD. However, there is this uh, hormone here called allopregnanolone, which is a, actually a GABAergic neurosteroid that comes from progesterone that might be um, elevated in PMDD. So there, oops back here. So there is uh, one study here from our group, uh, the top one, where we, we found that only individuals with PMDD, allopregnanolone levels was, was quite elevated, like 2.5 times fold uh, compared to uh, healthy volunteers, uh, individuals with bipolar disorder, individuals with bipolar disorder plus PMDD, uh, and both in the follicular and the luteal phase. So it wasn't like a fluke or some laboratory uh, you know, uh, abnormality because, you know, we ran all the samples at the same time and only in the PMDD group, allopregnolone was high in both follicular and luteal phase. And then when you look at the literature previously, uh, already other groups have seen that. Uh, you can see this uh, study that investigated allopregnolone throughout the day. They were in, interested in the circadian variability of allopregnolone and how that relates to cortisol uh, circadian variability. And you can see that uh, Allopregnanolone levels seems to be elevated in the PMDD patients in this study as well. So we talked about a little bit about the uh, neurobiology. So let's talk about the clinical presentation. So this is how the DSM-5 uh, textbook uh, revised uh, latest version uh, defines PMDD. In the majority of the menstrual cycle, at least five symptoms must be present in the week, uh, final week before the onset of menses. Start to improve within a few days and become minimal more absence in the week of post menses. So these are the core symptoms of PMDD. So at least one of them must be present, including marked affective lability or mood swings, suddenly feel, feeling sad or tearful, increased sensitivity to rejection, very common. The other one, which is actually the most common is uh, increased irritability or anger, which may or may not lead to increased interpersonal conflicts. Uh, depression, of course, uh, low mood, hopelessness, uh, low self-esteem, and anxiety, feeling anxious, tense, skid up on edge. And then one or more of those symptoms to combine for a total of five. So decreased interest in the usual activities, so anhedonia, uh, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, lack of energy, changes in appetite, more or less appetite, changes in sleep, more or less sleep than usual, have a sense of uh, being, feeling overwhelmed, out of control. And then also, of course, the physical symptoms that are cardinal to uh, PMDD, breast tenderness, swelling, you know, muscle pain, bloating, uh, and et cetera. Very importantly, these symptoms are, need to be associated with significant uh, distress for that individual or interfere with their ability to function. And I say that I highlighted the distress because PMDD is tends to be short-lived for the most part. So we're talking about, you know, two, three, four days that are horrible, that are terrible. But the person knows that that's happening. The person knows that that's coming again next, next month. So these individuals, they have an incredible ability to adapt their lives around the PMDD. So you will know, if you only pay attention to the decreased functioning, you're not gonna find, you're not going to diagnose them correctly. But if you ask them how much they're distressed about, how much they suffer, that's when you're gonna get the, uh, you know, the, the diagnosis right. Now, really important, and of course, for all of those experts uh, in the room here and uh, those individuals that, uh, know about it, uh, they know the importance of uh, prospective daily ratings, but this cannot be, uh, uh, you know, overemphasized because uh, 
over half people, about half people that come to the office saying, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I have a suspicion I have PMDD. Once we do the two month prospective charting, half of them don't have it. So the rates of a false positive is, is very, very high. And I'll show you some numbers uh, momentarily. But before I do that, I wanna present this work that I find it uh, fascinating, really, really shows how the uh, different facets of PMDD can, can, how PMDD can present with different uh, clinical facets. Remember in my take home message variable and I highlighted underscore variable exclamation mark. Like this is the study that really uh, nailed it, which we found over and over again in our clinical practice here. So Dr. Uh, Tori Eisenlor Moll, a psychologist, like a tremendous researcher in this area from uh, Chicago. So they published this uh, work a couple of years ago where they follow individuals with diagnosed PMDD according to the DSM. So all of these 34 people, they do meet criteria, P DSM criteria for PMDD with prospective daily charting. But even by doing so, you can see that their clinical presentation may, may vary. So you see that some of them have their symptoms have, uh, starting way earlier, right, right after the ovulation. So almost two weeks of symptoms before they're starting to improve uh, post menses. Whereas other people, you know, have the surgency of the symptoms more or less uh, at the time of the premenstrual week, but it takes a little longer for them to have their symptoms minimized. Like it takes days into the menstrual cycle to the bleeding to uh, minimize. And then there's, uh, you know, a, another uh, people that are more than what the DSM traditionally says, you know, emergency in the premenstrual week and then starting to improve immediately after the menstrual. Certainly we see those people, but don't forget that there's this, you know, variance of sometimes starting earlier, sometimes stopping it later. That is very important for us when we diagnose, because if you don't have a lot of experience, you might just, uh, think that this is not PMDD. And then uh, I'll tell you the patients, they become really disappointed disappoint because they don't feel validated, they don't feel supported, and they know they have this issue over and over again every month. So it's very important for clinicians to understand this uh, uh, clinical variance of PMDD. So if you wanna ask uh, me, is there a good screening tool uh, for PMDD, yes, there is. So here it is uh, already published, uh, you know, almost two decades ago by Dr. Steiner. Uh, these are the DSM uh, back then uh, four uh, TR um, symptoms of PMDD. So uh, this is a very good screening. You know, uh, these are the DSM criteria. And then at the bottom here, how much interference uh, they, they have with those symptoms. So this is a very good screening. A good screening is one that when it's negative, you have very, very high confidence that it's negative. But if it's positive, this questionnaire is not diagnostic. Do not take this questionnaire as diagnosis because half of people that score positive or even more than half sometimes actually don't have PMD, have other things. But when they score negative, then you don't need to worry about. When they score negative, you have over 90% of confidence that they do not have PMDD. So a good screening is screen people out, but they do not give you a diagnosis. The diagnosis is always prospective with at least two months, at least two menstrual cycles. And here is the actual number uh, showing why, you know, the screening is a good screening, but not a good diagnosis. Uh, diagnostic questionnaire. So these are 127 women uh, that did both the screening and the two month prospective daily charting with the DRSP. And as you can see, those who scored negative in the PSST in the screening, you know, was about just over 20%, which is the same rate as the DRSP gold standard. So he is showing that when the screening says no, it's probably a no, which is excellent, which is what, what you need for a screening tool. But when it says positive, look here in the PMDD chart that all of these people here that score positive in the PMDD actually had PM, PMS. They did not have like the severe form of, of PMS. They did not have PMDD. Only, you know, about uh, in this in this uh, study here, you know, about the two to four percent had uh, PMDD once you do the prospective daily charting. 
So look at the kappa, the agreement is very poor between the screening and the prospective daily charting. So the take home message here is that the screening is excellent. If it's no, it's a no, but if it's positive, you do need to do the prospective daily charting. There are many, many tools for prospective daily charting. I'm not gonna go over uh, each of them uh, because I wanna give a, a broader overview about PMDD today. This is one of the many um, uh, you know, useful questionnaires out there. This one uh, we published uh, earlier this year. And we developed this one because uh, PMDD, as I'm gonna tell you momentarily, is highly uh, comorbid. So if we just pay attention to this, sections two here, the PMDD symptoms, and we don't pay attention to potential comorbid conditions, we're gonna lose a lot of information. So we developed this tool that tracks both mood and premenstrual symptoms at the same time. And I'll show you how it, it works uh, momentarily. And uh, I'm really happy to share with this group here that uh, our uh, questionnaire is now out out there available in the app store uh, as an app for iOS uh, uh, individuals with iOS uh, platform. The uh, Android version is uh, is being uh, developed. So uh, the beta version is ready, but it's not ready for prime time yet. There are some bugs that we need to fix, but we're getting there for the Android version. But the Mac, the iOS version is already out there and ready to use. What is nice about this questionnaire is that there's a button here, share button. So the individual can complete the monthly questionnaire, click on the button and then share that with their healthcare provider, you know, uh, which makes it really helpful when the patients come back here to the clinic, I have their, you know, uh, a chart on the screen for us to discuss um, each time. I ask them to send the questionnaires right before their uh, next clinical visit. So this is how the paper version looks like. This is a real patient that gave me permission to do this, uh, share this for educational purposes. Her name is, uh, is blocked here. So this is a, a patient with both PMDD and PTSD. So he, she has a comorbid condition of PTSD. You can see the bleeding here, the menstrual bleeding. And then right before the bleeding, the symptoms, the premenstrual symptoms are go all the way to six to extreme. Like this is a very severe PMDD. Look at her mood coming from feeling stable, fine to down, like really to a severe type of depression. Then after treatment, this is what happened. So you can see the bleeding here. Uh, the symptoms improved to a threes and four. So from very severe to mild to moderate. Uh, and you can see the mood is still down for a few days, but not nearly as bad as it used to be. And what is nice about this paper version and the app version is that they can track here life events. And here they say, you know, this was a PTSD triggering day for me. This is not hormonal. This was a life uh, stress, which is really nice when clinically to, to see the effects of the treatment. This is the app version. It's the same questionnaire, just the app version. Another patient, this patient has a, a MDD comorbidity and generalized anxiety disorder comorbidity with PMDD. So here's the bleeding, here's the premenstrual worsening, very clear, fours and five, so moderate to severe. Uh, and then after treatment, the symptoms improving to two or three. So the symptoms are still there, but way better than it used to be. And this is the importance of the, uh, shows the importance of the, um, why I'm doing this today, why each time Dr. Galia asked me to be here, I will always be here, Dr. Galia, because we have to spread the word about the importance of this. Like uh, healthcare professionals are not really well, um, you know, educated about it. So this is a, a, an unfortunate uh, result of a really important survey that was just published. Over 2,500 uh, individuals who sought treatment for premenstrual pre pre worsening, and they were seen by at least one health professional. Okay, a general practitioner, gynecologist, psychiatrist, or other mental health professionals like counselors, you know, psychotherapists. Two thirds of them, the diagnosis was not confirmed prospectively. So the, the health care professionals are not asking them to confirm the diagnosis of a PMDD, you know, as we should do prospectively. And if you look at the, who's doing better, who's doing worse as far as uh, health professionals in this, uh, um, survey while GPs and they were all doing not doing you know well because the most 
cases were not uh, confirmed, but as you can see, the gynecologists seem to be a bit more aware and ask more of the questions than the GP, psychiatrists, or the other uh, mental health uh, professionals in terms of basic aware, basic basic awareness of the condition. You know, uh, again, the gynecologists seem to know a little bit more according to the patients, but you know, GPs and the mental health uh, professionals and even psychiatrists, you know, need to to do way better. So the next point is that PMDD is highly comorbid. So this is a very large survey from um, um, Germany. It's a community survey where they went to people's houses. They did the survey. Four years later, they went back to their houses to redo the survey to look at the you know, stability of the diagnosis. And they found that those who scored positive for PMDD had a lot higher risk to, to, be, to also have another comorbid mental health diagnosis including bipolar disorder, major depressive disorder, panic disorder, social uh, anxiety, PTSD, pain-related uh, conditions, and, and so on. This is another study done, uh, this one in, in southern Brazil, also community-based survey uh, with exactly the same results. So those who scored positive for PMDD had way higher risk of also having PMDD, algorophobia, bipolar disorder, suicide risk, generalized anxiety, and so on. So PMDD seems to be associated with higher risk of other psychiatric uh, conditions. So we need to be mindful and we need to do a good job uh, supporting those people. This is our own survey, um, looking at this very large uh, database of individuals with uh, comorbid bipolar disorder and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. And those with the comorbidity, uh, same story, had higher rates of uh, uh, comorbid, another comorbid condition like anxiety disorders, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, PTSD, and so on. And then more recently, folks, uh, there's been a great deal of studies uh, suggesting that PMDD actually carries a risk for suicide behavior. I'm going to show you three studies, but there's more. So this is a very interesting meta-analysis of suicide uh, in general. This is not a study on PMDD. This is a study on suicide in general. And they, these are all studies that looked at suicidal behavior according to the menstrual cycle. So we have the menstrual days, the follicular days, periovulatory days, luteal, and the premenstrual. And they found 26 greater percent greater risk of suicide deaths. This is death. This is not attempts at the time of menstruation. 17% uh, greater risk of suicide attempts at the menstruation. 20% greater risk of psychiatric admissions at the menstruation. And 13% greater risk of psychiatric admissions during the premenstrual phase. These risks, folks, were not elevated in those using hormone uh, contraceptives, which may suggest some kind of a protective factor. So what happens here is that the risk starts to increase at the premenstrual phase, and then in the menstrual phase is when the action is actually done, okay? And when the individuals are actually admitted, those who survive. This is a study uh, from our group here where uh, we systematically reviewed uh, uh, studies done in individuals with PMS or PMDD. The previous study was in, the, in general. And this one was in those with a PMDD or PMS. And the story is the same. So in those with PMDD, there was a four-fold risk, increased risk for suicidal ideation and seven-fold risk for suicide attempt. In PMDD, 10-fold risk for suicidal ideation, but no risk for suicide attempt. So only PMDD diagnosis was associated with attempt, but both PMS, PMDD associated with ideation. And last but not least, another uh, study from uh, Dr. Isla Moore uh, just uh, published where they looked at um, almost 600 individuals that uh, did the survey, a long, online survey. Uh, they say that they were prospectively confirmed diagnosed according to their healthcare professionals. And the question was about self-injurious thoughts and behaviors. And you can see that in individuals with uh, both uh, PMDD only and PMDD with comorbidity, 
had quite elevated rates of passive suicidal ideation, active suicide, suicidal ideation, and so on. Of course, those with psychiatric comorbidity had higher rates, uh, but even those with PMDD only had, you know, quite the significant rates of lifetime uh, suicidal thoughts or, or attempts. So three very independent uh, studies suggesting the same uh, outcome. But having a comorbid condition like PTSD, like borderline personality, like bipolar disorder, imposed the anoxic challenge for PMDD. So this is a case of someone with PMDD, but this person was in a current bipolar mixed state. So here's the menstrual bleeding. And premenstrually, you just cannot see it because, you know, there is this massive, uh, uh, you know, current uh, mixed states and the symptoms are very much overlapping with the PMDD symptoms. So you have, we have to treat the comorbid condition. So once the mixed state is treated, then you can see, you know, the PMDD uh, quite clearly, you know, uh, here in the chart, and then you can do something about it. So my point here is that a lot of people with PMDD, they know they have PMDD, but they have a comorbid condition that does not, that, that, uh, decreases our ability as clinicians to see the PMDD in the pro premenstrual uh, daily charting. And then a lot of them end up being ruled out. They say, clinicians say, no, you don't have it. They look at this chart and say, no, you don't have PMDD. And then the patients are disappointed. They again, don't feel validated. They don't feel supported. So it's important for clinicians to understand that, you know, PMDD is highly comorbid. Let's listen to the patient. Let's treat the comorbid condition and then let's do it again the charting once the, pre the comorbid condition is treated. So then we can see the premenstrual dysphoric disorder there. Um, so that completes the second part of my talk. And I'm gonna now start the third part, third and last part of my talk on, uh, on treatment strategies. So the treatment for uh, uh, PMS, PMDD includes both non-pharmacological and pharmacological uh, approaches. So there are, uh, here I'm just showing those that have been subject to like so-called randomized uh, clinical trials. So there is a carbohydrate-rich uh, uh, um, diet. Then, in fact, the, the 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 core of this diet is that increased tryptophan, um, you know, absorption. So we are we are presumably indirectly increasing serotonin uh, synthesis by by eating diet. Uh, that increased, you know, uh, tryptophan absorption. That was a positive. Exercise seems to, to help a bit in some cases. Uh, CBT uh, also seems to help, particularly with the coping, particularly with the, you know, psychoeducation. Uh, CBT would not block, of course, the biological, you know, worsening, but it does help uh, quite a bit uh, people emotionally. If you want to look at vitamins and complementary medicines, uh, there is a study uh, that compare placebo with vitamin B B6, 100 milligrams. Another one comparing calcium 600 twice a day with placebo and they both uh, help uh, PM, more PMS symptoms rather than severe PMDD. Uh, but then there's this really interesting um, uh, um, natural compound. Uh, it's a berry, chase berry, uh, that has some uh, studies. I'll show you the meta-analysis momentarily showing some uh, um, benefit. So it's my clinical um, experience that the chaseberry help with, uh, you know, moderate cases, the vitamin B6 and calcium only with more mild cases. And the most severe cases will, will need, uh, you know, either SSRIs or SNRIs, like the antidepressants or the oral uh, contraceptives. Uh, I do have uh, quite a few patients now, probably about over a dozen patients that I've tried everything, nothing worked. Then I sent to my colleague here, uh, gynecologist to do the Lupron treatment, like block the HPG access with Lupron uh, in order to block this uh, premenstrual worsening. Usually more severe cases with suicidality and psychosis uh, triggered by uh, the premenstrual phase. Surgery, it's very, very rare. Like ophorectomy is very, very rare. Uh, I, I can only remember one case that I really uh, thought was uh, you know, reasonable to, to try for a person that didn't respond uh, even to Lupron. 
Um, so here's the, if you want to know the evidence for PMDD for the antidepressants. So there are 33 randomized controlled trials, and this is a lot. <laughs> 33 randomized controlled trials is actually a lot. So you are seeing here one of the Cochrane um, database uh, uh, systematic reviews and meta-analysis showing you know, improvement. After that, there's this JAMA Psychiatry RCT that, of sertraline that was published. Um, so as you can see, these uh, uh, compounds, they have serotonin in it. Um, it is less studied, but it's, it's good clinical practice. Like it's expert opinion that uh, non-serotonin-based drugs like bupropio does not work very well for PMDD, uh, neither do lithium. Uh, and then second line agents would be like the uh, estrogen-based uh, contraceptives. Uh, there, there have been, you know, uh, randomized controlled trials with four different compounds. Only one had two trials, which is here, like the, the here in Canada is called YAS, which was, uh, you know, positive. And then there is, uh, you know, uh, lower level of evidence. This is an open trial, so be mindful of lower level of evidence. But in the clinical practice, sometimes you see people that they try antidepressants, they really don't benefit much or just a little bit. They try the oral contraceptives, they don't benefit much, just a little bit. But when we combine both uh, antidepressants and the oral contraceptives that, you know, they do get uh, qu quite a bit of uh, benefits. And this, uh, this is just a study of those they were using antidepressants and they had here the premenstrual worsening and they added the oral contraceptive two months later, the premenstrual worsening uh, was down. So just, uh, but this be careful because this is an open trial, like low level of evidence. This is my uh, opinion about when to consider hormonal treatments. Uh, I would suggest those with moderate to severe PMDD who did not respond to antidepressants or they don't wanna use, or they cannot use antidepressants or they wanna use hormones for contraception, and then you can do both. And of course, they must not have contraindications for uh, use of hormonal treatments such as cardiovascular, neurovascular conditions, uh, risk for thromboembolism, uh, suspicion of breast cancer, endometrial cancer, liver cancer, first degree relative with breast cancers and migraine with uh, aura. Uh, if they do take uh, oral contraceptives, let them know that the full effects are typically seen only after the second menstrual cycle. So you might not see after the very first. Tell them that uh, hormones are not for everybody. Uh, that one in five will actually feel worse. So if they feel worse, they need to come off of it. Make sure you look at the drug interactions and continue to do the daily charting to ascertain a treatment response. I promise you I was going to show you the, the meta-analysis of the... Um, the uh, VTAX. So these are the three independent meta-analysis suggesting that this compound might might work. I'm looking forward to collaborating with uh, basic scientists to understand the the, the mechanisms of this, uh, and uh, I, I very much look forward to seeing this uh, area move forward. I, I presume there might be some interaction with the estrogen receptor, maybe even the BDNF, and so on. For those who want to understand a little bit more about pharmacotherapy, including the new uh, treatments that have been uh, um, you know, investigated as pilot or proof of concept, uh, we just published this invited. This was an invited review. Uh, Nancy is my, a shout to my um, amazing family medicine resident, Nancy, and my uh, master's student, Maya, for collaborating with me in this uh, review. And with that, I will uh, go back to the take-home message. So current evidence suggests that PMDD is associated with brain sensitivity to hormonal fluctuation, to normal hormonal fluctuation, but, but comes from the allopregnanolone. Is it true that allopregnanolone is, is abnormally high? I think this is something we need to follow up on. PMDD is a prevalent and highly variable, remember that, and pervasive condition associated with high risk for other comorbid psychiatric condition and also suicide behavior. So don't underestimate the, how PMDD can be a problem for, you know, for people out there. Evidence-based treatments uh, largely focus on serotonergic-based antidepressant or estrogen-based contraceptives and underlying mechanisms for new treatments. I think it's a really a major gap. And I hope to, to learn from allopregnanolone and learn from a Chase Berry extract and so on. 
So thank you very much. Uh, it's exactly 345 uh, here, so 12.45 in uh, BC. So I'm looking forward to the discussion uh, section. Thank you, Dr. Galia and everybody at the Women's Health Research Cluster for having me here today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Frey. That was amazing. I learned so much. Uh, I know it's uh, difficult to see the enthusiasm from the audience, but I do see a number of <laughs> lovely emojis, at least the clapping. You can also feel free to unmute and clap as well. Um, <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Please, everybody, if you have a question, you know, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat, whatever you prefer to do. Uh, because you know what will happen if you don't, I will ask the questions and then it's always me asking the questions. But I, I just thought it was really, uh, really, really fantastic. Like I said, I learned a lot and I have a number of questions for you, but you know, it shouldn't only be about me. So does anybody want to um, ask a question? Romina, you look like you came on camera. Did you have a question for Dr. Frey? Yes, I do. Um, I Hi, Dr. Frey, my name is Hello. Romina. I'm uh, in Dr. Galea's lab. I have a question in regards to the antidepressants. Is I don't know if I missed this, but there is, is there some research to um, suggest one uh, type of antidepressant is better than the other? For example, fluoxetine versus um, citalopram or something like that. Yeah, so there, there isn't, okay? There isn't any evidence suggest that one uh, is better than the other. The mm -hmm. serotonergic based uh, ones, they, they tend to work when they work, you know, for, uh, I, I believe uh, genetically, you know, we are so variable that some mm -hmm. of us will respond really well to some treatments and some of us will not. So those people that respond well to antidepressants, uh, they tend to respond pretty much um, similarly to those medications. Uh, what we don't see, what we see differently is more so in terms of side effects. Okay, so side effect profile can be very different. Having said that, when SSRIs don't work, I think there is a uh, room to switch to an SNRI, to a serotonergic noradrenergic uh, combo, okay, drug. So I would say that both SSRIs and SNRIs are worth trying before we give up on the antidepressants, okay? Uh, but our brain is so very, Variable and our genes are so variable that uh, I would be reluctant saying that you know there's one better than the other without uh, scientific evidence. There isn't scientific evidence that one is better than the other. But what you're in the clinical practice so well, as I said, like things like Wellbutrin, for instance, uh, or Bupropion, which is uh, an epinephrine dopaminergic drug, which is very good for depression. Uh, but it's not really that good for uh, PMDD. So it sounds like for PMDD, you do need the serotonin. I see. Yeah. That, thank you so yeah. much for your thoughtful answer. Mm -hmm. I actually have one more question. Sorry. Yeah, um, <laughs> um, my question is if you know of any prevalence between postpartum depression and premenstrual dysphoric disorder. Oh, that's also Missy Olson's question. So that's great. Yeah. So oh, okay. I, I saw, I, um, I have the chat open here and I saw Missy's okay. question here. A shout to, to, to Missy. Uh, so some studies say yes, some studies say no. Mm. Okay, so it's, it's not, not all studies have found PMDD being a, a risk factor. And similarly, the menopause transition, which is another window of vulnerability, some studies suggest yes, and some studies suggest mm. no. So, you know, so that's, so the, Dr. Fire, you're not helping me here saying some yes or no. So my suggestion to those out there is that because some studies said yes, you know, bring that to your healthcare professional. Remember that yourself, that you might be one of those people that are more sensitive to all of those windows. So be mindful, you know, for those who have PMDD when you get pregnant or, you know, in the menopause transition that those might be challenging for you. But it's not all people, okay? So for, for sure, we see patients that did, you know, had, uh, you know, did not have, you know, uh, postpartum depression, uh, you know, despite the fact that they had, you know, terrible history of uh, PMDD and, and vice versa. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, I'm wondering if there if those studies that disagree, if they sometimes don't categorize by postpartum, rather do perinatal, but it's yeah. Yeah. So just that's a good point. Yeah. Because uh, half of the postpartum depression actually start in pregnancy. Right. It's not, a true, it's not a true postpartum onset, right? So the mechanism is uh, obviously be different. different. Yeah. 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 Um, we have, you have so many questions in the chat. This is the, this is the first time for us, which is great. I'm very happy with the level of engagement. So I, I think you have it open too, but Tara is asking, do you see any eth ethnic differences at all in, in your clinic? Do you see any particular, um, you know, uh, differences by, by race and ethnicity? Yeah, what, what we see is a, a difference in terms of trauma. We, mm -hmm. we know that... Um, you know, uh, people from uh, different uh, racial or ethnic backgrounds, they have more risk for uh, experiencing uh, early trauma. And then early trauma is a risk factor for, for PMDD. So we don't know if the what we see is a direct, like uh, genetically based ethnical, um, you know, risk, or if it's, it's in, for from indirect uh, reasons in terms of, uh, you know, the different exposures to different uh, risk factors. But yes, there is a difference. Thank you. And then, uh, Kelsey, you guys can also ask your own questions too, if you'd rather not me speak with your questions. But uh, so I'm just waiting to see if Kelsey wants to come online or not and ask. It's a great question. Um, so it's a little long, but I'm sure you can read it. Um, can you talk a little bit more about potential treatment avenues for uh, people that experience severe PMS versus PMDD? And if if so, many many women have PMS, it interferes with their functioning, but is it severe enough to be just defined as a PMDD? So what options would you say they have? Um, and, and the second part, the last little line there is, especially when many clinicians came, claim that PMS disturbances are, are, are normal. So my, one of my questions is why, why is it so minimized in sort of the clinical clinical world? Yeah, uh, but thank you. So uh, I will answer, and if this computer, which was the only one that were telling me that uh, I have only 10% of battery, oh, I'll good. log into the, to the other one, okay? But at least the presentation is, is done. Thank you. Uh, so, um, so the first question, the severe, the, Severe PMDD, if PMS is severe enough to interfere, that's enough for a diagnosis, okay? So I would say if instead of severe PMS, if there is an interference, significant interference, it's probably mild PMDD then, rather than severe PMS, right? Because the diagnosis is really based on, you know, level of distress and uh, interference. If there's significant interference, it, that's enough for diagnosis. PMS by, by itself, um, you know, the definition is that you should not cause interference or major distress, right? So if there is a, a, a distress, uh, significant distress involved, I would say it's probably PMDD, even though it might be mild. So PMDD has a, a big uh, degree of uh, severity, right? So not everybody feels suicidal, not everybody feels, you know, uh, that the interference is, is that bad, but you know, I would say it's probably more mild PMDD. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I, I would suggest uh, what I say in those more mild cases is that, you know, try the the chase berry, try the calcium, try the the vitamin B6, try the CBT, try the exercise. Um, I've learned from a lot of my patients that soy-based uh, food helps. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I, you know. This is not, I've heard from multiple people. I tend to eat more sushi, for instance, more, you know, it, it does help my, my PMS. Like, I, and I'm telling you, multiple people telling me that. So uh, to me, it's not surprising because, uh, you know, so, uh, uh, soy sauce is a, is a, is a weak estrogen um, receptor binder. Like it does bind with estrogen receptors. So I, I, it's not surprising to me that that happens. So I would suggest, you know, try those uh, so, so-called safer you know, uh, treatments before you think about uh, either or contraceptives or, or, or antidepressants for more mild cases. And then in terms of the other questions about uh, why is it so uh, um, uh, no or, or, or minimized. minimized or neglected, mm -hmm. I can spend the entire day here uh, ranting yeah. about that. Like it's a fight for me to add uh, women's mental health as a core 
uh, you know, area in psychiatry curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, we now, I, I have not been able to do that, but I've been able to do that for family medicine. So we have now family, all family medicine residents for, yeah, from uh, McMaster University rotating here, like we are now a core rotation for, for them. It is about education. We need to push for, you know, this is an important area that needs to be taught early you know, in psychology, med school, doesn't matter which health professional school, nursing, you know, healthcare professionals need to know. It needs to be part of the educational curriculum. Mm -hmm. Until then, we're going to be, you, you know, uh, 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 graduating people that don't have experience with it. They don't know. They don't know how to diagnose. They don't know how to handle these cases. Mm -hmm. So let's continue doing what we're doing here. I, you know, uh, mm -hmm. health advocacy and, yeah. uh, and the award should not stop. Um, I just, I want to, I think I speak for everyone that I want, I want to listen to that day of ranting. Just, it's just uh, not that it's great to lis listen to people being angry, but I do, I think it's important. Obviously, I think it's really an important message to uh, come across because we can help a, a lot of people. Um, you see, you have many more questions, as you can see. Uh, uh, do you think that a DSM-5 diagnosis covers the symptomology of PMDD or are there other aspects that have become prevalent that are not found in the existing diagnosis? I bet I can answer that without being an expert. Yeah, so there, there are, you know, uh, Dr. Uh, Tori uh, Eisengumor, like the, the one that I just said, she actually wrote a paper about it. Like mm -hmm. all of the other facets of PMDD, they're not exactly captured by uh, the DSM. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know what? Suicidal ideation is one of them. Yeah. Because once you start asking them, you know, those days are so dreadful that most of them, well, at least once in their lifetime, felt that, you know, what, life is not worth living in, on that day. Oh. You know, so it, it, is, uh, it is really, there are facets of uh, PMDD that we see in the clinical practice in terms of sensitivity, in terms of, you know, the, the that type of, um, you know, cognitively, like it's very hard for them to function. Like there are the cognitive aspects of the brain fog that happens with PMDD that is not captured in the DSM very well. So mm -hmm. there are emotional, behavioral and cognitive aspects that um, Dr. Um, Eisengo uh, Mo has uh, really nicely um, laid out in her uh, recent paper. So, um, Okay, great. That's great. Yeah. Um, I think maybe one more question, um, although there's just, there are so many other things I'd like to talk about. Um, Julia is asking, should women come off of treatment at menopause? I think it's yeah, awesome. so PMDD, of course, uh, you know, disappears when uh, the ovaries stop working, right? Uh, then, uh, of course, uh, then that, that's when the PMDD ends. It's when a uh, the, the, the hormone, the ovaries stop. But the unfortunate part of PMDD is that uh, a couple of risk factors that I didn't mention, um, one is age mm. and the other one is uh, pregnancies. Mm. So, which are correlated with each other, but, you know, the older you get, the more risk for you to get pregnant. So, you know, so uh, yeah, so PMDD tends to actually get worse over time. Mm -hmm. So it's not uncommon of seeing people in the clinical practice that they said, you know, before children, my, I had like pretty much PMS. It wasn't really, I had the symptoms, but it wasn't really bothersome. But then after children, now I'm feeling, you know, the symptoms are just way worse. Mm -hmm. So there's something about approaching the tail end of the reproductive cycle mm -hmm. uh, before the menopause transition. So that period you know, you're still in the reproductive cycle, but you're not yet in the transition to menopause, that end of the reproductive cycle that is associated with higher uh, risk for more severe symptoms of PMDD, unfortunately. Oh, wow. That, um, that's really fascinating. I didn't know that. And that suggests to me that there are some other hormones that might be involved. Exactly. Too. So, all right. Well, obviously there's a lot more to do in this area and I hope, please join me again in thanking Dr. Frey for an amazing talk and shedding light on this really important area. And thank you all also for all your questions. You're really super engaged and I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, obviously we need more, I don't know, more, just more, more, more. <laughs> so thank you again, Dr. Frey. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Gali, again, and your team. And uh, thank you for the audience. This was really engaging. Like, I love the discussion as well. Thanks so much. Let's spread the word. Continue spreading the word. Spread the word. <laughs> Very good. All the best, everybody. Thank you.
Bye, everyone.